Hello, welcome to Chapter 6, Memory. I hope you can remember all the things we cover in this presentation. I'm going to try to cut it a little bit shorter than my last one. It turned out to be a little bit longer than I wanted it to be. Uh, we're going to go ahead and skip the objectives. Um, you know we'll be covering, you can read this. Uh, first of all, let's talk about memory. Um, this term brought up uh, 1996 by Baddeley. Memory is an active system that receives information from the senses, organizes and alters that information as it stores it away, and then retrieves the information from storage. So there's three processes. One is receiving the information, organizing it in a neural form that your brain can understand, and then uh, being able to retrieve that information. Um, My Psych Lab video uh, is here if you have access to My Psych Lab. Um, just interviews people about how is your memory. Uh, first of all, the process of memory. Um, like I said, it was three steps. There's encoding, the uh, mental operations based on sensory information. And then your brain converts that information to a form that's usable. And storage is um, long-term, short-term memory. We hold that information for some period of time. And then there's the ability to retrieve that information. So sensing, storage, and retrieval. So first of all, the information processing model has to do with um, processing information from memory storage, similar to the way a computer works um, in a series of three stages. You have the, you know, the input, and you have the, the memory, and then accessing the memory. Uh, parallel distributed processing model looks at the memory processes that Kind of, that take place over over um, a large network of neural connections. In other words, um, I'm perceiving and filing information and retrieving new information all at the same time. Uh, so those are three parallel processes going on at the same time. Um, your computer um, probably is not as complex as the human mind and doing all three of those at once. <clears throat> looks, next, let's look at models of memory. There's what's called the levels of processing model. It assumes that information is more deeply processed or processed according to its meaning rather than just the sound or physical characteristics. For instance, uh, when you learn a new word, a lot of times we use uh, different models that not only look at how to spell the word and, and define the word, you learn to use a word in a, in a sentence, you learn um, you draw a picture of it. Um, by doing that, it helps us to um, dedicate that, that word longer into our memory. Uh, helps us to think uh, more about the meaning of something. And here's a concept map about what is memory, if you want to click that. You're only able to access this when you open up the PowerPoint. Um, unfortunately, when you click this link during the video, it, it doesn't work. So. To reinforce again the three-stage process, you have your uh, encoding, auditory, visual information, um, and that goes into what's called your sensory memory. Uh, it doesn't stay in there very long. Um, your your brain kind of picks what's important, what's not, and then moves on. Your short-term memory is kind of like your um, desktop, um, your desk in front of you. Um, it's information that you're dealing with at hand. And your brain is constantly taking information that you feel is useful and throwing away information that um, it thinks it's not useful. And um, information that's retained goes into uh, long, long-term memory. Okay. Um, first of all, sensory memory is the first stage of memory. At this point, the information enters the nervous system to the sensory system. Uh, here's another concept map to understand this process of memory. Um, next is an iconic memory test. George uh, Sperling in 1960 came up with this. And what he learned is that subjects could only remember four or five of the letters, no matter how many times they were presented. However, when he, prepared, when he uh, paired it with a tone, uh, like these letters with high tone, these letters with a medium tone, and these letters with a low tone. He found uh, there was a lot more letters recalled. Um, however, if there was a delay in the signal, um, the whole amount of recall had dropped significantly. Um, 
he, he also that was called the partial report method. Um, he also came up with a term called masking, and that's information in iconic memory will be pushed out very quickly by new information. Okay. Um, I guess a, a key thing that I missed about iconic memory, um, George Sperling um, coined this term iconic memory, but it's basically visual sensory memory, and it, a lot of times it only lasts a fraction of a second. Think of the, the word icon, it's a Greek word for image. Um, it's our imagery memory, okay? And we have a capacity that uh, everything can be seen at one time. For instance, I'm driving down the street, and I'm, I'm listening, I'm scanning the view, the road, and uh, all of a sudden, after a second, I, I look around and I say, oh my God, um, what was that? Was that man wearing any pants? Um, that's called taking a double take, and it's a brief presence of a memory that came back. So the brain is, you know, I'm consciously, you know, have an eye on the road, but almost like without even me noticing, things come to, you know, my notice that may not have before. That's called taking a double take. Um, where masking is the information is pushed out very quickly by new information. Now, this term eidetic imagery, that's a rare ability to access a visual memory for more than 30 seconds. For instance, um, some people are able to read a page from a book and then look at a blank sheet and recite that page word for word. That's a rare ability. Uh, some people call it photographic memory. Uh, echoic memory has to do with remembering what's just been heard. And capacity is limited to what can be heard at any one moment. And it's smaller than the capacity of iconic memory. In other words, we can remember images um, easier than we can remember what was said. Um, uh, however, the, the, it lasts longer than iconic memory about two to four seconds. So uh, when we hear something, we process it, and within two or four seconds, we, we let go of it. Um, echoic memory. Oh, let me go back to echoic memory. Um, have you ever had someone talk to you and you were kind of watching TV or in your, into your cell phone or something like that? And you looked up and you said, what? Oh, yeah, and you try to recover. Uh, you were talking about what? And you, and you try to um, recall some of the last few things they said to try to say face and pretend like you understand what they were saying. Um, that happens a lot in what's called echoic memory. Now, short-term memory. Uh, remember we talked about um, sensory memory is kind of like um, your, what you're hearing, what you're seeing. Uh, where short-term memory is all that information is gathered onto your desktop. Um, it's what's in front of you. It's what your brain is paying attention to. The memory system, which information is held for brief periods of time while it's being used. Now, the working memory is, is within the short-term memory that processes the information in short-term memory. Um, and there's basically three parts. There's what's called the central executive part that decides what information is important, which one's not. Um, and then there's what's called the, the sketch pad, and that's um, processing what you saw. And the auditory recorder is processing what you heard. Um, and the working memory is uses what's called selective attention. Uh, it usually is only able to focus on one stimulus from all the other s sensory input. Um, that's why it's very important not to text and drive because um, we can only focus on one stimulus. Next is a digital span test. Um, George Miller <clears throat> came up with this um, in 1956, and he came up with a series of numbers, um, and it's, it's read to subjects who are then asked to recall the numbers in order. Um, what he found out is uh, short term memory is about limited to about seven items or pieces of information, plus or minus two items from five to nine bits of information. So in other words, how many items can we recall in one sitting? The magic number is seven. Um, if you take this what's called digit span experiment, you have to open up the PowerPoint to click this link. Um, it's kind of fun. You can test your own um, 
recall. Uh, I had an embarrassing thing happen at work. Last year they changed my phone number. Not only did they change the seven digit number, but they changed the area code because uh, Omaha has more than one area code now. For, some, for the love of God, I cannot remember this new number. I don't know if it's the new area code, it's more than seven, but I practice it and practice it. And it's, it's very difficult to remember a 10 digit number. Now, one way to help remember that 10 digit number is doing something called chunking. And that's breaking that 10 digit number into bits of information. So I have the area code, which is I think 530, I keep forgetting the area code. Um, and, and once I get that down, then I can remember the seven um, digit phone number. Um, but chunking is where we kind of remember better by putting chunking things together. And, uh, it's more likely to be held by our short term memory. Now maintenance rehearsal is, um, it's, we have to practice it over and over in our head um, to, in order to be committed to our memory. So for instance, uh, if I want to learn someone's name, have you ever had someone introduce themselves and you forgot their name like two seconds later? Um, what you have to do is learn, when you learn a name, is associate the name with something about the person's appearance. So it's, it's not only just maintenance rehearsal of the name, you're associating the name with something else. This is an example of George Miller's digit span test. Um, and people are able to remember up to seven plus or minus two um, with this, which shows our, our capacity for uh, recall. Short-term memory lasts uh, from about 12 to 30 seconds without rehearsal. So if someone says their name and you don't rehearse it and you don't run it through your head one more time, you're probably going to forget their name in 12 to 30 seconds. And then you kick yourself and say, oh, I forgot to do the association thing. Um, Short-term memory is susceptible to interference. In other words, um, have you ever tried counting something and somebody was like counting at the same time? Um, you get messed up and you have to start over. You get easily, um, interference can easily mess up our, our working memory. Okay. Next is uh, long-term memory. Um, our brain has, it's like a huge series of filing cabinets that are behind our desk. So we're working memory or short-term memory is like our desktop. Long-term memory is our filing cabinets where we can store an infinite amount of information. That's right. Your brain can restore an infinite amount of information more than your laptop or your, um, your cell phone. It's just a matter of you know, using the techniques to remember. Um, Long-term memory, um, when, it's, when it's put into our brain, uh, it's relatively permanent physical change in the brain. Um, elaborative rehearsal is a method of transferring that from your information from short-term memory to long-term memory by making that information meaningful in some way. For instance, it's important you don't remember where you parked the car a year ago. It's not meaningful. But somehow we have a way of uh, telling our brain that information is meaningful and it's stored properly in your brain. Now rote information, it's um, practicing by maintenance rehearsal. It's rotating information in a person's head. Um, but elaborative rehearsal is more like making um, association, um, making it deeply processed so it'll be remembered over time. Now, uh, an association might be associating with music. It'll help you to remember things. Um, for instance, how many of you know how to sing your ABCs? If I'd say, what's the 15th letter of the alphabet? No, nah, your book said that. Um, would you be able to come up with it without going A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Kind of cool stuff. Next, types of long-term memory. Um, there's two main types. One is non-declarative implicit memory. Psychologists, you like to use big words, but when I say implicit, try to think unconscious memory. In other words, this is stuff that we gather without even thinking about it. Uh, this is long-term memory, including memory for skills, procedures, habits, condition, responses. For instance, uh, several, of you, several of you said you were athletes. Um, the, the memories are not conscious when you learn how to kick a soccer ball. 
Um, but the existence is implied because they affect conscious behavior. Um, these memories may include emotional associations, habits, simple conditioned reflexes that may or may not be conscious awareness. For instance, uh, learning to tie your shoe. That is uh, implicit in your implicit memory. For instance, try to explain to somebody how to tie your shoe. It's kind of hard. You kind of have to show it. And once you learn it, it's committed to memory. Um, how you ride a bike. Um, these are skills. Um, even people with Alzheimer's, um, they, they're still able to walk, ride a bike, play piano, play instruments, because this is what's called non-declarative memory. Um, next is procedural memory. Uh, it's memory that's not always brought to conscious awareness. Um, there's a term called anterograde amnesia. And this is where you lose your memory from the point of injury forward, or the ability to form new long-term memories. Um, I guess um, I'm going to get back to this in a minute. Um, so for instance, uh, in the Tower of Hanoi, patients with uh, anterior grade um, can learn moves um, on how to what you have to do is you have to move the discs from A to C, but you can have a bigger disc on top of a smaller one. So um, they learn the puzzle, um, the patients with amnesia, anterior grade amnesia. Um, but when they're brought back to the room, they don't recognize the person or the puzzle, yet they're quickly able to solve the puzzle. In other words, their non-declarative implicit memory was still intact, even though they're... Um, their other memories were not. Okay, next is declared or explicit memory. This is our conscious memory. Um, this is a type of long-term memory that includes information that's conscious and known. Um, this is any information that people can, in, can learn and know. Um, so all the things that people know is explicit memory. Uh, semantic memory is learning of words, language, uh, everything you learn in formal education. For instance, um, everything you um, are quizzed on in Jeopardy, semantic memory. Episodic memory has to do with uh, any personal information that may not be readily available to others. These are uh, daily activities, birthdays, childhood events. Um, some things would be especially memorable in your episodic memory it might be your first date or the day you get married or the day your child is born. These are um, memories that are um, they're blazed into our memory through emotion. They're emotionally charged. Now, semantic and episodic memories are a form of explicit memory that's consciously known. Here's a little information processing model to help you review that. Next, um, your long-term memory, as we talked about. Um, you have your implicit memory, which is your motor habits, skills, ref condition reflexes. And then we have our conscious memory, that which can be learned, semantic memory, and that which is experienced um, and connected by emotions. Next, uh, long-term memory is organized in terms of related meanings and concepts. The semantic network model assumes that information is stored in the brain in a connected fashion. Concepts that are related to one another are stored physically closer to each other than they are to unrelated concepts. Let me explain that in the next slide here. Okay, for instance, if I say uh, a canary is a bird, you can make that connection pretty well in your synaptic, uh, semantic network. However, if I say a canary is an animal, that's making a two-step connection in my semantic network. I have to stop and think a little bit more and say, oh yeah, um, it is. Okay. Um, Cues to help remember. Uh, I know students are real concerned about how do I remember stuff I need to know for the test. Um, there's what's called a retrieval cue, and that's a stimulus for remembering. Uh, priming can occur, that is to say, experience with information or concepts can improve later performance. In other words, if I'm teaching a new concept and if you cannot connect these words to previous experiences, it's a lot harder to remember and unless you're able to associate it with your experience or some um, prior knowledge. 
um, encoding specificity. This is a tendency for memory of information to be improved if the related information available is connected with your surroundings or your physiological state. In other words, if you're in a good mood, um, you're more likely to remember. And um, we'll talk a little more about that later. Um, also, context-dependent learning means uh, you're more likely to do better on the test if you're taking a test where you studied the information. So if I'm taking a chemistry test and I take it in the chemistry class, I'm more likely to do it in the class, to do well in the class. Um, have you ever forgot what you're looking for and you're wandering around, well, what was I looking for? And if you try to return to the original place, it could jog your memory. So that's uh, context-dependent learning. Um, next on encoding specificity, specificity is state-dependent learning. Our memories formed during a particular physiological or emotional state will be easier to recall while in a similar state. For instance, uh, when I go to a wedding, um, I suddenly and have the good feelings of the wedding. I suddenly recall my own wedding. Uh, it's easier to recall when I'm in the same emotional state. Um, also, subjects um, that are in a better mood have better um, recall of information. So if um, you're in a good emotional state, you're more likely to um, have better recall. Recall. Um, there's two types of um, tests. There's what's called recall tests, where memory retrieval in which the information may retrieve must be pulled from your memory. In other words, if I have a test and I say fill in the blank and I have the word and you put the you have to put the definition down, or if it's an essay question, that's going to require recall memory. Where um, where the opposite is um, where if I have some uh, what's uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. I'm having my, my own recall issues right now. Uh, retrieval failure is recall has failed at least temporarily. Uh, do you ever say, oh my God, I can't think of that word. It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, <laughs> there's uh, tests that are for recall, and then there's tests that, oh, dang it, I, um, it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't remember. <laughs> um, so if you want to try the uh, experiment serial position effect, you can go ahead and click this link right here on the PowerPoint. Um, the serial position effect is where we tend to remember stuff in the beginning in the end of a body of information, but we tend to more likely forget what's in the middle. So the primacy effect is I'm more likely to remember the beginning of, of the information because I, my brain is, is, is blank it's, and I can fill the blank I'm sorry, it's like a blank, um, blank slate, and I'm open to new information. So there's less interference, uh, the first part of the information. And then during the middle, somehow my brain gets distracted by interference, and then I tend to remember the information towards the end because I don't have new information pushing out that current information. So I'm more likely to remember the beginning and the end. Sorry about the middle. Okay. This chart shows the primacy effect, um, or the serial position effect. Um, try not to be in the middle for job interviews, too, because when if you a whole group of people are being interviewed, they're more likely to, the person that's going to be most memorable are the people who are in the beginning, primacy effect, and the people at the end, because they're fresh in their memory. Um, so, and also, same applies for when you're studying for tests. If you're cramming and studying for several hours, you're going to remember the first part, then you're going to remember the end part. All this part will be lost from your memory. So, if you study in smaller segments, that'll reduce the chance of having what's called a model of middle to model effect. Um, so, if you study in small segments, this middle section here will be remembered. Next is recognition. Um, for instance, when you see a face, um, you're able to match a piece of information or a stimulus to a stored image or fact. Um, false positives um, are a possibility, and that's when you think you recognize someone, but you're wrong. Um, and um, this could be really bad when it comes to witnesses for a case. Uh, the case of Father Bernard Pagano. He was falsely identified by seven witnesses um, to a crime. However, uh, people were sure it was him, 
uh, another man later confessed to the crimes. Um, so he was a victim of false positive recognition. Um, let me talk a little bit more about uh, Elizabeth Loftus. I uh, did a lot of research in this field uh, in 1975. She talked about the importance to keep witnesses separate, um, separate from others uh, because the information they include they incorporate the information and actually add it to their own story. So our, our, she showed that what people see and hear about an event after fact can easily affect the accuracy of their memories. Um, she demonstrated that eyewitness testimony is not always reliable. She, what she did is she sh showed a three minute video to a, a class and then she had recall questions and what she did is um, she used the recall questions to lead the, the subjects to a different conclusion. And actually, um, the, the, the recall questions helped um, change their, um, what they saw, their story of what they saw, which is kind of scary when it comes to meeting eyewitness testimony. Okay, next is uh, automatic encoding and flashbulb memories. Automatic encoding Encoding is a tendency of certain kinds of information to enter long-term memory with no or little, no or little um, effort. Um, I guess an example of this is if you kind of notice patterns or frequency of events without even paying attention, you could say, "Yeah, I noticed uh, traffic was was pretty intense," but it was kind of on the side. Your your brain was noticing those things. A flashbulb memory is. Um, that encoding auto is automatically occurred because of an unexpected event that has strong emotional association. For instance, uh, I will always remember on 9-11 when we heard those new the news about 9-11. I remember where I was, who I was talking to, um, the feelings I felt, um, pretty much the events of that day. Um, and that would, uh, and there's a little video here on flashbulb memories. How long-term memories are formed? We use what's called constructive processing. Um, and this is where memory retrieval process, in which memories are built or reconstructed. Um, I guess what you want to think about is the process of memory is more like creating a story than reading one. And this is from Sir Bet Frederick Bartlett, 1932 on memory. So with each retrieval, memories may be altered, revised, like a story, or influenced by newer information. Uh, one of the things that could be influenced by is uh, what Barrick in 1996 called hindsight bias. And this is a tendency to falsely believe through revision of older memories to include newer information uh, that one could have correctly predicted the outcome of the event. For instance, a lot of people claim to be uh, like to be Monday morning quarterbacks. Oh yeah, of course, hindsight is 2020. Next is a uh, misinformation effect. Um, this is where there's, there's a tendency of misleading information presented after an event to alter the in, memories of the event itself. So false memories could be created by a person being exposed to information after an event. So if they hear another testimony, they would say, oh yeah, that's what happened. And that could be, uh, that's why it's important to keep um, people, uh, witnesses apart so they don't share their stories because they could be uh, affected by the misinformation effect. False memory syndrome. And this is a creation of inaccurate and false memories through the suggestion of others, often while a person is under hypnosis. Uh, some people think hypnosis helps improve memory, but it doesn't. What it does is it increases confidence, removes interference. Um, however, it's important that we have solid evidence from other sources. Um, evidence suggests that false memories cannot be created for just any kind of memory. So usually memories have to be at least plausible. For instance, if a child um, says, uh, I've been abused, um, take them very seriously, um, make sure that uh, most of you will be our mandatory reporters. Make sure you report it to the authorities um, and let, leave it to the professionals. Um, they want to make sure that the child doesn't get interviewed by 20 different people who might, you know, lead them to make up or 
come up with information. The kid might feel like, oh, I have to give information. This is what they'll want to hear. Um, it's important that uh, a professional does not lead them to come up, make up information. Next is the um, uh, research by Ebbinghaus in 1913. He came up with what's called the curve of forgetting. And it's a graph showing a distinct pattern in which forgetting is very fast, usually within the first hour. Um, so when you learn something, um, if, you, if you don't keep practicing, um, you're like, less likely to have uh, retrieval. Uh, mass practice is studying a complete body of information at once. So it's important to, instead of cramming for hours at a time, remember the serial position, we, we forget what's in the middle. If we have short bursts of practice, um, you're more likely to learn this material. So instead of watching this whole video and trying to push through it, maybe break it down to 10 minute chunks and then get up, take a little break, and then 10 more minutes. Um, I realize these are really long videos. Um, next is uh, the curve of forgetting. This is a graph. Uh, notice how quickly um, learning happens or memory recall happens within the first hour. It drops really fast. And then it's days. Um, why do we forget? Sometimes there's what's called the encoding failure, which means the, the, we fail to process the information to memory right away. For instance, take a look at a stop sign. You see a stop sign many times. Which one of these stop signs is um, close to the a real stop sign? It would be the one here, middle right. Uh, so encoding failure could misinterpret information. The next one is uh, memory trace. In other words, there's, it's a physical change in our brain that occurs when memory is formed. We could have what's called memory decay. In other words, we lose the memory over time. Uh, however, it doesn't explain why elderly people can tell such wonderful stories from the past. Um, but disuse means in our brain, um, information will decay if we don't um, use it. Um, so in other words, your memories use it or lose it. Uh, so your memories recalled after many years are not explained by this memory trace theory. Um, next is interference theory. In other words, um, we have trouble learning or because um, other information is interfering. For instance, proactive interference is a memory retrieval that occurs when older information prevents the retrieval of newer information. For instance, let's say you get a new cell phone and you're used to using uh, a cell phone with buttons and now you're using a cell phone with, what's that called, slide, slide thing, I don't know. But it's like, ugh, I'm used to just dinking and pushing buttons. I'm not doing no slide thing. That's because I have proactive interference to um, learning that information. Retroactive interference has to do with problems uh, occurring when the newer information prevents or interferes with the retrieval of older information. So let's say uh, I go back to using my son or daughter's phone and their phone is a lot older and I forgot how to use I'm having retroactive interference. There's a little concept map I'm forgetting here. Next, uh, uh, this is another, two more examples, retroactive and proactive interference. If you're studying two languages at a time, you would definitely have that. Um, so I'm studying French, and now I'm studying Fran Spanish, and then I take a Spanish test, and the French just gets in the way. Or retroactive is I'm studying Spanish, and now I'm studying French, and it's messing me up on the French test. Okay, next is um, reasons for forgetting. This is just a review of what we just talked about. Um, formation of long-term memories through consolidation. These are the changes that take place in the structure and functioning of neurons. Um, so we have what's called long-term potentiation. Changes in number and sensitivity of our receptor sites and synapses through repeated stimulation. So there's physical change in our brain. Um, the long-term memory um, is stored in what's called the hippocampus. Um, in the case of uh, HM, um, the poor kid um, had issues with seizures. And what they did is they removed uh, the temporal lobes 
um, in hopes of stopping his epileptic seizures. What they found out was the kid was unable to remember anything new. Um, so the hippocampus is a very, temporal lobes are a very important part of the brain. Um, he experienced what's called retrograde amnesia. In other words, he had loss of memory from the point of some injury back um, or the loss of memory from the past. Um, I'm sorry, that's that wasn't the same. Anterograde Ante amnesia was what the kid experienced, which is loss of memory from the point of injury forward. In other words, he was unable to learn new long-term memories. So um, he still had his past memories, just wasn't able to learn new information. And here's a little concept map on neuroscience memory. If you click it, it looks something like this. Maybe not because the computer is really slow. Oh, it's showing up on my other screen. Let me slide it over. See, there's a concept map. And you click it. It opens up and it says, okay, it's neuroscience of memory. We have different brain areas. And these are the different memories. Procedural memory, short-term memory, semantic. Several physical changes in the brain at the receptor and at you have changes in dendrites, uh, long-term memories in the hippocampus. I like this because they show a lot of um, um, it, 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 a graphic image of what we just talked about. There's organic amnesia, there's retrograde, there's, that's from the memory backwards, and then there's an anterior grade, which is memory forward. And we talked about the guy who had part of his brain cut out, and he was unable to learn new information. So those kind of concept maps are kind of helpful to help you learn. Um, let's talk about uh, retrograde amnesia, which is called uh, Alzheimer's disease. And it, it, it affects 5.3 million cases just in the United States. It's the third leading cause of death in late adulthood. Uh, I think now that people are living longer, this is uh, becoming more and more of a common problem. And this is where you experience primary memory difficulty, experience um, through anterograde amnesia. In other words, they're going to remember how to play instruments. They're going to remember their path. Or, um, they, they remember their past at first. At first, what they do is they lose new information. Um, now, there are what's called um, early onset M, uh, Alzheimer's, which is more genetic, but that only makes up about 5% of cases of Alzheimer's. There are drugs in use or in development in slowing or stopping Alzheimer's, but there's no cure. Um, they can delay it, but it, it doesn't cure it. Uh, risk factors include, and so these are, if you don't, if you want to reduce the chance of getting Alzheimer's, um, keep your cholesterol low, your blood pressure low, don't smoke. Don't eat too much. Um, keep uh, blood sugar regulated. Um, healthy exercise, healthy food. Um, also keep your brain mentally active. Um, you, you'll tend to um, you'll tend to do better if you take good care of your brain. All right, that's it for memory. I hope you memorize this. You'll probably just remember the beginning and the end. So have a great week.